I really encourage you to practice like, from now until Monday, you have like three days and this afternoon, three days and a half to practice active listening. Uh, here and there, there's a little experiments. You will find people will love you. People will love you. Now, so just giving active listening to friends, strangers, anybody, people will be surprised. So some people might actually think you're flirting with them <laughs> uh, because you give them your full attention. Right? Uh, but really, like, uh, you w so people will really love you, but you will learn so much. Like, like John Francis describes, the, the momentous experiment that he did at 28 years old of realizing, wow, I had not been listening. Now, if you want to push it, if you want to push the experiment, pick a situation where you really don't want to actively listen. Somebody who annoys you, somebody who you think always has told you the same story multiple times. Um, I have a, 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 an interesting story for me, it's with my mother. Right? So my mother is like, chatty as hell. Uh, she's like, uh, in my family in general, we are not good at active listening. Uh, we practice talking, competitive talking, very widely. Uh, we, we all pretty, you know, my mother and my brother and I are pretty extroverted. My father and sister a little bit less, but, uh, but usually like it's a lot of talking at the other person. And, uh, and my mother in particular can really literally talk for hours without you saying anything. And so, and usually I've heard the same stories so many times and I get annoyed by the stories. And you know, eventually, usually we end up in a conflict when we spend too much time because she's talking so much, she's not listening to me. I have all of these past uh, sort of frustrations from, of growing up with a mother who didn't give me attention, didn't listen to me, didn't listen to anybody, right? So, so it, it activates, uh, uh, past hurts and uh, unmet needs, right? But one day I decided to do an experiment, a big experiment. I was going to drive from uh, Luxembourg all the way to southern France. So that's like an eight hour drive, right, with my mom. And I was like, I'm going to practice active listening for the, those eight hours, see, what, see how it goes, right? Uh, I really tried to change my normal reaction, which is I've heard that a, a thousand times. That's my, my reaction. Can you please, like, Sometimes she says stuff that also bothers me. She expresses judgments that I find distasteful, you know, judgment about other people and, you know, and I'm like, oh, can you please stop like saying that? That's not cool or whatever. So I was like, I'm just gonna, instead of all of that, I'm gonna really practice active listening. Uh, and it, it was amazing. It was, I mean, it was really, at some point it became unbearable after, you know, six hours of that. Uh, I, <laughs> So uh, what was interesting is uh, my wife was also there in the car and she was in the back. I told her I was going to practice the experiment and she was observing the experiment and observing me in the experiment and my mom, so it was an interesting. Uh, but wh what I realized after a while, so my mom speaks for like maybe a good two, three hours, uh, <laughs> the first few things. Yeah, she's, she's kind of like that. And uh, she tells me the same story. And instead of saying I've heard the story a thousand times, I'm like, really? Wow, that's interesting. Uh, practicing all of these tricks, you know, like, and how did that make you feel, you know? Uh, and I realized that out of all the stories that I heard a hundred times, I, I, I had never practiced active listening. So, I, in fact, I didn't know the details of how it made her feel, where it came from. So, I, that was quite an eye-opening thing for me, that even with somebody I've known all of my life, uh, and the stories that I've heard a hundred times, I could learn something new. Right? Uh, the other thing is that at some point, you know, she, she didn't know what I was up to, but I think that she was getting something that she had never gotten, which was attention. The reason she doesn't give attention and she talks a lot is that probably she didn't get attention herself growing up. Uh, so she craved attention and once I gave her what she wanted, she relaxed a little bit. She still kept talking, but she relaxed. Now, you know, uh, after a while, that was a funny thing. She turned to me and she looked at me like, is this for real? Are you making, f you know, I could see like the thing of like, are you making fun of me? Like when I was like, wow, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Uh, like, wow, I, I want to know more about that. Uh, she was so used to me being like, I've heard that story a thousand times, you know, can you stop that, you know? Or that's boring or, you know, my sort of like rash reactions. So, uh, that, that's, that after a while, she kind of looked at me like, he's actually listening. And I could see that looks so sort of like, whoa, you know. Uh, 
is this for real or not? And then eventually she kept going. You know. But um, <laughs> the funny thought is, I, I, th I think it was about six hours into the trip of like still talking. You know, I tried to sort of respond at some point, and she said, uh, "Well, will you stop interrupting me? You, you keep talking, and, and now you don't listen to me." And my wife at that point jumped in and said, "No, no I've been like tracking what's been happening. You've been talking for six hours." And that was the, one of the first times he interrupted. But, uh, so that was another, you know, eventually, like, uh, uh, my patience wore thin after six hours, you know, the eight-hour trip, you know. Uh, but, but, you know, that, I'm just sharing this little experiment where, you know, how you can practice that. So that would be, for me, the person I'm not really disposed to listen to is my mother, because I need to be listened to, and I have a lot of past sort of, like, uh, baggage with her not listening to me, but also, I have become terrible myself at listening. So, uh, you know, to me, I, I would say that that's a key test for, for, for any therapist, any psychologist, try to practice your art on your parents. See, see if you can do that. If you can do that, you're a pretty good therapist. <laughs> you're a pretty good psychologist. But, I mean, think about who, who are the people you might not be disposed to listen to. Maybe some friend who annoys you, some acquaintance, somebody, somebody that you've already have an open and shut judgment about them. Like, I know exactly what that person is about, or what they're going to say, you know? So, so uh, uh, Carl Jung had this great advice, which I, I think is amazing. Everything that irritates us in others is an opportunity for us to learn something about ourselves. <laughs> so think about that. If I'm really irritated with somebody else, instead of running with the irritation and going like, oh, you know, that person is like, ah, uh, you know, the typical reaction we have. And then whatever next is, like I move away or I shut the other person off or, you know, maybe I get upset and tell them off. Instead, if I'm like, ah, I'm really annoyed right now. I'm really annoyed. So I'm going to check that annoyance. I'm not going to move on. That, that, that's, that's, uh, it takes a lot of um, endurance, a certain kind of courage to say, I'm going to stay in the annoyance and observe it. Kind of like a Buddhist monk, right? Uh, I'm really annoyed right now. What quality of annoyance is What's going on in me? Let's listen to the other person. Let's see what is it about what they're doing or saying is that annoys me. What is it about their voice, their body language, their emotion, what happened before, what it all represents. When did I feel annoyed like that before? In which other situation have I felt those feelings? You know, that's, a, that's a very interesting uh, exercise to learn. So I encourage you to do that in the weekend. Um, I want to share one more thing before we, uh, we, we break, which is the Johau window, uh, which was developed by a guy called Joe Luft and uh, his colleague Harry Ingman. So they call it uh, playfully the Johau window. And they, I've, I've met Joe, and he told me that later he found that Johari is a word that actually exists in uh, Swahili, uh, which is an African language, which, uh, which actually means something that's very related to the the motif, so it's an interesting uh, happenstance. So this is a, a gr good model of interpersonal disclosure that's, that has been used in T groups for a long time. So you have four quadrants. When you're talking with somebody else, you have what you know about yourself that other people know about you. That's your public self, right? So typically, th some demographic info informations uh, about us are in the public domain. So it's usually pretty obvious that I'm a man, right? It's obvious that I'm, you know, mostly European, right? It's obvious, you can tell approximately my age, right? Uh, and then there are other things that you might know about me that are public. You know that I'm a professor, I've told you that I, you know, went to UCLA for my PhD, blah, blah, blah. You know, there might be other things that you could find out on my website or whatever. Uh, then there are things that I know about myself that I, I don't disclose to others. This is kind of like, uh, tends to be the stuff that I might feel a little self-conscious about, the stuff that I want to be private about. You know? uh, I don't want to tell you about my medical record. You know? I don't want to tell you about all of my uh, sexual escapade stories you know, uh, in my life. You know? I don't want to tell you about all of the bad stuff I've done in my life. Right? <laughs> Uh, so, you know, th th there are things that I know about myself that I don't share. Uh, maybe more surprising, there are stuff that you know about me, that others know about me, that I don't know about. Now, how, that, how could that be? 
those are blind spots. A great example of that is your, your profile and your back. Most people see your profile all of the time and you don't see it. When you look at yourself in the mirror, you, you can see, you see your, your, you know, the best you can see is maybe like a, a sort of like diagonal. But so when you see a photo of yourself in profile, uh, you, you know, it's always surprising. It's not experience. It's like, oh, that's what I look like. Or if you see yourself in the back, but everybody sees that. So that's a physical uh, example of blind spots. But there's, there's, of course, psychological blind spots. We talked a lot about biases, right, your filters. Other people might be better able to spot certain filters you have, certain beliefs you have, certain behavioral traits you have that you might not be aware of. Maybe you have a tendency to cut people off and you don't realize, you know, and everybody realizes but you. Uh, and when people tell you, you tend to cut people off, you, you know, you most likely you get defensive and say, I, I don't cut people off. That's not true, right? Uh, so then people know that about you, but because you, you're defensive about it, you, you never really actually integrated it in your self-knowledge. So that's a blind spot. And then there is what, uh, the sort of like the unknown, what is true about you that neither others nor you know. Now the Joha window invites you to open the window. So when you share something about yourself that you normally don't share, maybe more private information, uh, and when other people give you feedback about you that they would not, not normally give you, part of what I'm inviting people to do in the tea group, you open the Jorahe window. A lot of things happen. Uh, trust is built, intimacy is built, but also knowledge, great knowledge, is acquired both about others and about yourself. Uh, so it takes courage, it takes risk taking for that to occur. You know, a typical example of this would be uh, getting out of the closet. Right? It's been gay for a long time in many societies still today, is, is, is a very difficult experience. Uh, th thank f you know, I, I'm happy that the U.S. is progressing and making it more uh, okay you know, to come out. But uh, so coming out is still an experience where you're revealing something about yourself that was hidden for a long time, and uh, now other people understand you better. Now people might interpret you better. They might be, oh, I understand what that behavior was about, what that, you know, uh, that aspect of that person is. Uh, when somebody else shares something about you that they would not normally share, it could be positive or negative. Uh, also, uh, you learn something about yourself. Uh, what's interesting is both things happen. You might discover aspects of the unknown by putting two and two together. Uh, on this one, some people are afraid of giving feedback to others for fear of offending them, for fear of their reaction. Right? Uh, and what I like to uh, tell people is imagine if you are having dinner with somebody and you have a piece of food that's on the corner of your mouth, right? uh, that's kind of standing there. Do you want people to tell you or not? How many of you want to be told? Right? How, how likely are you to tell other people when, you, when they have a piece of food in the corner of their mouth? Less likely, right? Now, you're more likely to do it with people you feel comfortable with, friends, family. If it's a stranger, like if it's your boss, right? Less likely, right? 